Thank you, Ken, for that very kind uh, introduction. And after the last presentation, I'm proud to say I own two horses, too. So <laughs> I've, I've got it covered. Uh, you'll see some common themes here, which I think is interesting. Uh, since man's earliest r recording of life, and here we have another cave you know, picture, uh, mostly of animals, uh, the evolution of dogs and the social and economic developments of mankind have been closely intertwined. In different locations and in a steadily expanding number of ways, man and dog have been enduring allies. And that's the uh, name of my, my talk today. Um, so we're going to talk about the development of our working relationships with dogs going way back to the beginning and trying to track that to today and how we still test for some of those working characteristics. So there are certain traits that are inherent in uh, almost all working dogs. Through selective breeding, these traits have been accented uh, and paired up to develop a wide variety of working breeds as we know them today. Uh, many of our working dog functions have shifted from utilitarian to more of a sport. Uh, we don't hunt, uh, most of us don't hunt for meat anymore. We, we go hunting uh, and, and pursue the sport of field trialing for the enjoyment of the sport itself. So today we retain these working skills through the testing and performance events. And so when I talk about performance events in this uh, presentation, it's, it's the hunting skills for pointing dogs, retrievers, and spaniels. Uh, it's herding, it's lure coursing, earth dogs. It's a test of the historical skill that that breed was uh, made to, to do. <clears throat> One of the advantages that I have in my job, uh, uh, which I think is a very unique uh, position, is that I get to go around and see all these different working dogs, talk to the owners about their dogs, and, and, and learn from them. And you'll see a common set of traits, characteristics, uh, that run through all the working uh, dogs that we have. And that's what I've tried to list here. The first is instinct. Uh, and, and that probably be the first to come to most of our minds. Uh, if, if, if we wanted to go bird hunting with a pointing dog, uh, we, we, we are very lucky nowadays that that dog has the instinct to point. If we had to train that into the dog or breed it into the dog, it would take us quite a while. Uh, so instincts, uh, number one. Uh, desire or drive is another one. Uh, I do a lot of hunting with dogs and sometimes the hunting isn't very successful and you might walk for hours and hours and hours and never find a bird. Yet that dog is there just hunting the whole time, and many times I have watched that dog. The pleasure of the hunt is really watching the dog. And you say to yourself, what's driving that animal to continue to work with seemingly no reward? Uh, he hasn't found a thing, and I've been out over three hours. Uh, it's just inbred into them to really have a strong desire. Uh, intelligence is obviously very important. Trainability, all our working breeds work in conjunction with a person. Uh, so they have, there has to be a trainability factor. The disposition of different types of working dogs is different, and we'll try to uh, highlight that as we go along. Physical ability uh, is the thing that we test for in our confirmation shows. Uh, the dog has to be built correctly to perform the function it was meant to do. Uh, courage and toughness is uh, very important in a lot of our sports. If you are a dog that works in packs, you have to be willing to work with other dogs, which some are not. It's very interesting to go to a beagle field trial where they may put down a pack of eight dogs, and the judges will be looking for, there'll be some of those dogs in that pack that will refuse to take the lead. They're just not comfortable being at the front of the pack. There's other dogs that insist on taking the lead, and they're always in front, whether they should be or not. And so uh, those are the things that judges are looking for in our pack sports. Uh, sustained concentration is one that, a trait that may not come as one of the first things to your mind, but if, if uh, all our sports need that trait, 
And if you were to take that trait and, and apply it to what I might think of as more um, a more modern day need, like an assistance dog, uh, he better be able to sustain his concentration for a long period of time. Or a bomb detection dog. He can't decide, I'm getting kind of bored with this, I, I think I'll give up. Uh, that just doesn't work. They need to be able to sustain their concentration. The fine line, fine balancing act between cooperation and independence. We'll see as we go through some of the different working dogs uh, there's a difference balance here, uh, but all of them to some de degree need to cooperate with their handler, but yet act independently. Uh, and then uh, one, in my research for, for this, uh, I, I did call up a, a lab trainer who is now training uh, bomb detection dogs rather than dogs for the sport of uh, retriever field trials. And I talked to him about what's the thing that makes labs such good bomb detection dogs and he said one that I was surprised with and that is the willingness to work for a variety of handlers if you're a dog working in a public setting uh, you may be handed off between different handlers during your dog career so to speak and you have to be able to accept a new handler and perform for him as well as you did the last one that was a trade I hadn't thought of before so a little bit about AKC. Uh, so many of us uh, now think of AKC as confirmation, but really right from the beginning it's been AKC's purpose and tradition to test for both confirmation and working, or in this case they call it field abilities. This is a, a, a book back from uh, the very beginning of AKC's history. I also thought it would be interesting to look at how uh, uh, the interest in dogs, has, different breeds of dogs, has changed over a hundred years. This shows the top eight breeds that AKC registered in 1890 on the on the left-hand column, and on the right-hand column is the top eight breeds 100 years later. I'm not sure I can draw a lot of definite conclusions from some of this, but at least some of the observations are. In the top eight breeds in 1890, there were three pointing breeds. Now there are none. Uh, there were no retriever breeds back in 1890, and now there are two. Uh, and, and, and the Labrador Retriever is number one. It's not only number one in the United States, it's number one in Canada and number one in England. So there's something about Labrador Retrievers that drive them to the top of the pack. That's right. That's right. Uh, the, the, the point was, if you couldn't hear, the Cocker Spaniels were retriever breeds. Now, the Cocker Spaniel was meant primarily to hunt the woodcock, uh, and, and it, it was intended to retrieve that if, if you were lucky enough to shoot one. Uh, the two breeds that were in the top eight 100 years ago and are still in the top eight are the Cocker Spaniel um, and the, the good old Beagle. Uh, the Beagle's kind of our, our, our number, our invisible a sportsman's dog. You don't think of that for the general public, but the number one uh, most entries we have in any of our performance events is Beagle Field Trials. We have a tremendous number of performance events. Uh, there are 17 different working tests that AKC acknowledges dogs' accomplishments in. We have over 4,100 events a year. So every weekend, on the average, there's 75 events somewhere in the country where people are out there enjoying and testing their dogs. Uh, and in total, 135 breeds can uh, compete or enter our trials or tests. And you can see a variety of signs here. Uh, the middle one on the bottom is a, a good old Beagle field trial sign, except they spelt uh, trial wrong. They got trail on here. <laughs> Um, but if you know the Beaglers, you sort of almost say, yep, that's a Beagle. Uh, and on the right-hand side is a homemade uh, earth dog sign, not very professional, but has a certain degree of personality to it. Um, this is a quote uh, from one of our speakers that we're going to hear after lunch. 
Bob, I, I, I stole the quote from you. Uh, I found this quite interesting. 80% of the dog breeds are modern breeds that evolved in the last few hundred years. So I, I was really struck by that. Because if there is, and I hear different numbers for how many breeds are there in the world, but let's say there's about 500 breeds of dogs in the world. Well, for the first, and this is another number that's kind of shrouded in gray, but let's say in the first 10,000 years, there was 100 breeds of dogs. In the last 200 years, 400 more breeds came, came about. That's, uh, that's pretty interesting. And, and, and what, why did that happen? You know, what's going on? Well, some of the things that I could think of, but obviously these are questions that a lot of people ponder, are suddenly a couple hundred years ago, the common person was allowed to have a dog, uh, and things that changed were land ownership, increased wealth, increased leisure time, and the development of modern uh, hunting uh, firearms. There's so many functions that dogs perform for humans, or humans and dogs perform together, I guess I'd say. I had to kind of bunch them into groups just to get my, my arms around it, and these are the four groups I came up with. Assistance with livestock, personal and household duties, hunting dogs, and public duties. So we're going to start into assistance with livestock. If there's anything unique about this, it is the, the way that man started in assistance with livestock, and that's primarily in herding or in protecting of the flock. When man started that, say, 8,500 years ago, we're still doing it today exactly as it was back then. So the thing that struck me is this sport hasn't changed in thousands and thousands of years, except perhaps moving from a utilitarian thing to a sport. So here we have the movement of livestock. This is a large uh, flock of sheep in eastern Washington. Uh, and there's a shepherd. There's no fences. Uh, those sheep could take off and, and go for a run and nothing will stop them except for the dogs that that shepherd has. Uh, and and uh, that's how it's been done for thousands of years. Now today we have our, our herding sports, uh, herding events that, that test the dog's skills to, to do this. Uh, in addition to sheep, our sport herds ducks and cattle. Uh, and there's 47 different breeds that are tested in our herding program today. It's a very large program in terms of number of breeds. The other function that I put in this category is the protection of flocks. We've seen some of that in, in other pictures. Uh, in some areas of the world, this, uh, this newspaper is from uh, an African country. Uh, the, 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 this function is still very important, as it is in some places in the western United States still. Uh, this newspaper in, uh, down on the, on, the, on the screen here talks about protecting sheep and goats from lions and tigers in Africa. So. Um, that's still something they do, uh, and it's very important. Now, herding is basically a prey drive, the instinct to chase, that has been tempered by a desire to please and a willingness to be controlled by its handler. Flock protection is quite different. Uh, the dog bonds with the flock, and he protects the flock by frightening away predators through posturing. Uh, so the dog doesn't get in a fight, uh, but he, he, his intent is to scare the, the, the uh, predator away by confronting it and warning it. And in fact, one of the things a good flock protection dog does is if the animal turns to run, it may chase that animal a little bit, but doesn't chase it very far. It comes back to the flock. So here we have some pictures of herding, uh, uh, Australian shepherds, Now we talked about the courage of a dog, a lot of working breeds. Well, you can see here you have your, your little old Australian sheepdog, I mean Australian sheepdog, Australian uh, cattle, cattle dog, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, confronting this cow, basically saying, stop. Uh, and that cow's a heck of a lot bigger than that little dog. So uh, there's a degree of courage there. Uh, here we have a border collie in a chute 
with a bunch of sheep wanting to come down that chute. And there's just this one little border collie standing in their way. It has to have uh, some courage to face off those sheep. Uh, in the middle, uh, we have a protection dog uh, showing the bonding uh, with the flock. Uh, another thing we had in our list of traits was the physical uh, configuration of the dog has to be such that it can do its job. Well, if you are a cattle dog, cattle tend to kick. You are, you, uh, are better off if you have short legs, if you're intending to herd cattle. And that's why cattle dogs have short legs. As you can see in this picture, they can get below the kick. Uh, so then on to uh, personal and household duties that dogs perform uh, uh, for man. The first one, obviously, was guarding. Uh, then we have uh, companionship. Uh, perhaps we wouldn't think of that as a job, but obviously it's very important to the the, the human-animal bond. Uh, dogs have done hauling for mankind over, over time, and today uh, we have assistance dogs. So guarding, now interesting enough, here's the same slide you saw uh, earlier. Uh, this, the wording on this says, beware of dog. And this was on the floor of an entranceway in the city of Pompeii which, of course, we know was covered up by a, a volcano, and so it sort of froze the city in time. Uh, that volcano occurred in 79 AD, and uh, they dug out the city, and this is one of the things obviously showing uh, the, the historical use of guarding for dogs. On the right-hand side, we have companionship. We've talked about the Egyptians and how they respected dogs, and uh, this was just a, a family scene with a dog a small dog underneath the chair there, uh, but obviously that was important to that, that culture. Hauling, uh, most of us think of hauling connected with the dairy industry in Europe, uh, where uh, you made your rounds like the old milkman, you know, when they came to your house, only this is before trucks, and so the dogs hauled uh, the milk around the, the town deli delivering it. Uh, we still have that sport today, uh, as you see on the right-hand side. And then, of course, we have uh, sled dogs, which are the hauling dogs of the north, super important uh, to the, the, the people that live there and, and to the uh, introduction of mankind to that area. It's the only way you could get around. Uh, the utilitarian function of sled dogs has been to some degree usurped by snowmobiles, but still uh, they're, they are uh, very popular as far as a sport today. Assistance dogs, uh, and there's others who know much more about this than I, but uh, I view this as one of our most highly trained, uh, difficult to obtain type of working dog. Uh, they're, in the simplest sense, uh, trained to assist a person with a disability. Uh, guide dogs, hearing dogs, and service dogs. Uh, this is where I think of the, the balance between cooperation and independence, where that person or that dog obviously has to be very cooperative to the desires of the person, but still perhaps at times override if, if he perceives a danger that the person doesn't perceive. Uh, very sophisticated dog, I would say. Now we're into hunting dogs. Uh, and the first, the first type of hunting dog uh, that, that bonded with humans and was used in that function were the sight hounds. And we'll, we'll see some of those here in a minute. Then we have the scent hounds that tracked animals by smell. Uh, then along, uh, somewhat later, came spaniels, pointing dogs, terriers, and our retrievers are probably the latest uh, type of hunting dog that's come on the scene. Uh, back to the Egyptians again, they were so good at recording these kind of things. Uh, on the upper left is, uh, a, is, is an ornament that came out of King Tut's tomb, and it shows uh, him uh, supposedly hunting ostrich, which 
Seems like an odd bird to hunt, but I guess they did. Uh, and w accompanying him was a, a dog. Uh, and you'll see that dog looked a lot like a Saluki, uh, which, which many believe is, one of, is the oldest uh, breed um, that we still know today. Uh, on the upper right-hand side uh, are a couple Salukis with uh, a person in Saudi Arabia who has a, uh, a falcon, and they, that, they hunted the two together. I, it, it, I found this kind of interesting because it was op actually the opposite of what I would have thought. Uh, because the distances were so great in the desert, they let the, they let the falcon go up and find the game first. And then the falcon would circle, and then you'd kind of get your dogs over there, and you'd turn them loose. They'd find the game but, and then chase them by sight. So these are Salukis uh, way back in time, and we still uh, test for those skills in our lure coursing event. That's a Saluki here in the middle. Uh, some uh, whippets down here in the right-hand side. They run, because they're a pack animal, they run in our tests in groups of three. And part of the test is don't beat up your brace mates. Um, there are 17 breeds that are allowed to participate in our lure coursing event, and they come in all shapes and sizes, as you can see in the, in the lower uh, left. The Basinji is an interesting dog. It's a sight hound that originates in Central Africa. And... Uh, it, it was an area with uh, dense forests, uh, so it was the opposite of the desert, but it was still a sight hound, and what it did was it drove the animals into nets, and lo and behold, here we can see some, some fellows uh, heading out to hunt with nets, because the jungle was so thick, they could spread these nets out, and the animal that was being chased didn't see it until it got into the net, uh, and that's how Salukis worked with hunters in Africa. Uh, Salukis are a breed that, I mean, uh, Basinjis, I'm sorry. And uh, Basinjis are in our uh, lure coursing events today. Uh, and what they chase, and they chase them with great gusto, is white plastic bags. <laughs> That's a rabbit. And it's very interesting because at the end of, the, at the, end of the, at the course, of course, they have to stop the white plastic bags. And these dogs just ju jump on them and shake them and... You know, they finally caught the prey. Uh, then came scent hounds. Uh, these are obviously dogs that, that hunt by smell. The other ones were sight hounds that hunted by, by vision. So uh, deer hunting uh, in, the, uh, in the upper left here shows a nobleman out deer hunting where his dog is tracking a deer or, or you know, going to find it to begin with, and then it'll be chased. Um, beagles are, are number one. Uh, scent hound today in the United States. They evolved uh, from England, where in the, in the mid-1500s they have packs of hounds, and actually at the time they were called small hounds and large hounds, uh, but the small hounds eventually became known as beagles, and we used to hunt rabbits. And having watched many beagles, I can tell you they are very good rabbit hunters. Um, 